Raiding in WoW has always been the most popular feature of Blizzard's most popular game to date, and it can be confusing sometimes to understand why for the modern player when there are so many alternatives to the game nowadays. Raiding is viewed as the pinnacle of the game's existence, challenging the most seasoned veterans and casual players to think outside the box and give it their all. We have watched for nearly two decades just how much fights and players have progressed, from the standing and hitting dilemma to thousand dollar funded organizations to topple the bosses the quickest upon release to prove they are among the best in the entire world. It could be argued that Race the World First, a phenomenon that's existed since WoW's beginning, has helped keep the popularity of WoW so afloat, as now anyone can tune in and learn from the best of the best. Over the course of this video, we're going to be talking about the complete history of raiding in the Battle for Azeroth expansion, an expansion that surely sets in stone our current perception of raiding in modern World of Warcraft. Following the widely popular Legion expansion, Blizzard had promised players a new version of their artifact weapon at Legendaries in the form of the Heart of Azeroth and the Azerite Armor. The new artifact would infinitely scale upwards in item level as you obtain new items to empower it called Azerite Power. As your necklace scales upwards, you would unlock levels in your Azerite Armor, allowing you to pick from an array of choice nodes suited for your class specialization. With this new armor, you would remove the long existing era of tier sets, as Blizzard now elected to have the sets of each raid fit the theme based on armor type rather than each class since the Azerite armor traits are designed to be class specific already. This system, while possibly good in concept, inevitably never really turned out the way Blizzard had hoped. Instead, it bred highly degenerate gameplay by essentially forcing the player to do a daily set of chores that weren't very fun for many people involved in order to attain the necessary Azerite power. What made this extra annoying was, if you missed a few days or weeks of your Azerite grind, your character's power level would be significantly behind others, and it could take quite a while to catch back up. This made the high-end Mythic Raiders aiming for a spot in the Hall of Fame farm upwards of 50 island expeditions a day to get any bit of advantage that they could, as island expeditions were an infinite farm of their necklace's power. Truthfully, Mythic players have always done insane strategies to get an advantage, and nothing like this really surprised anyone. However, the biggest change to this race to the world first is that it was the very first time Method, one of the very best guilds of the time, decided to stream their gameplay to the world on Twitch and reveal their strategies and angles to tackle the challenges ahead. It completely changed the game and became the new median for WoW viewership, bringing in hundreds of thousands of people from around the globe. As the very first raid in BFA, Old Deer had a lot to live up to, as the first raid set of Legion, Emerald Nightmare, was cleared in literally 18 hours. So Blizzard stepped up the game immensely and ensured that this tier would be one for the books, and it surely was. All things considered, the first few bosses of the raid would fall on the first day of progression. The real hard hitting started when all guilds met Fet to devour. This boss would wall guilds for three whole days before it was finally killed due to the fact that it was literally impossible mathematically. This was admitted by game director Ian Hazakostas, which marks a truly rare event when the dev team admits they'd made a large mistake. What would essentially happen is the boss would spawn corruption corpuscles. These would spawn multiple cis ads on the floor, which had to be hard swapped to and killed before they could finish their enticing essence cast. If they finished their cast, the boss would rush over to it and eat it, healing the boss for 30% of its health. This almost always would cause a wipe for the groups on Mythic, as the boss was already an insanely high DPS check, even for the best players and DPS achievable for the time. Now, the big problem that walled this boss off for so long was that these adds had way too much health. So, even when hard swapping to them on Mythic, you would barely be able to kill just one of the adds when there were two at a time. So, on September 11th of 2018, Blizzard lowered the health of the boss and adds a large amount on Mythic, and later that day, the boss would be brought down by Limit. Before the nerfs were made to make the boss doable, Blizzard stated that, for a 5 of 8 boss, a DPS check that makes even the very best guilds have to play insanely perfectly, while getting their item levels to the absolute highest possible, was too much. So they made the nerf, and soon after, the boss went down. Funny enough, Azul, the very next boss, died the same day, proving Fetid Devourer was just far too overtuned. Progression would then begin on Mithrax as Complexity Limit, now simply known as Liquid, and Method would fight neck and neck for their spot to progress to the end boss. Two days after the Fetid kill, Mithrax would fall and the finish line was in sight. At this point, Limit had made a name for themselves for being neck and neck with Method since Legion, closing in just barely behind each other each tier. When it came to Cahoon's mechanics, the biggest upset was the Power Matrix kit. Basically, the boss was completely immune to damage until you placed two orbs into the matrix to remove a shield. To move the orbs to the console, you needed a lot of pre-organization and very specific classes that are fast enough to run to the console before the debuff stops them, as you cannot hold it forever. While holding the orb, you cannot use any abilities, at least during the time of the Race the World first. 
This change was specifically made about a month after the world first kill was achieved, so that guilds still aiming for the Hall of Fame could rely less on warlocks, taking up a fourth of their raid. Cahoon specifically had many affliction warlocks at the time due to their massive damage from Deathbolt, the ability to be permanently doing damage to the cysts on the floor that slows targets in the power matrix zone with absolute corruption and demonic gateways to transport orb carriers quickly across the platforms. It boosted their numbers and allowed them to negate an otherwise very difficult aspect of the fight. Well, Deer would be no different as Limit took the ultimate gamble to attain their kill before method. Typically, in a world first progression, if a boss lives past the second week, the guild will reclear the raid and claim more gear for their players in order to get that last bit of percentage down. In Limbit's case, they opted to extend their lockout for possibly the first time in World First history, with the intention of using Vantis Runes, an item that permanently increased your versatility stat when engaged with a single boss, and gear from their weekly cash box to increase their item levels on Gahoot. It almost proved successful, as they'd managed sub 1% pulls and were just barely beaten by method. Unfortunately, at this same time, the Vantis runes and certain Azerite traits were nerfed that Limit had banked on to win the race. After 8 hard days of Uldir's release and 285 wipes later in Cahoon, Method claimed victory for the EU with over 260,000 viewers live on their Twitch channel at the time of the kill. And for any of you unfamiliar with streaming, that is generally considered a ridiculously huge number. BFA's second raid, Battle for Dazar Lore, was an incredibly versatile competitor with faction-specific mechanics. Certain boss fights would be told to the players through the perspective of their faction, or the opposite. An example being as Alliance, you would turn into Horde races and complete the encounter while Horde remained as they were. Horde would be turned into Alliance for similar fights like Rashtakhan, but the fights would stay exactly the same other than your character's racials change into the race you were given. This will be important later. In World First fashion, almost all of the bosses in the beginning fell on the very first day of raiding, leaving only the Stormwall Blockade and Jaina Proudmoor for the days after. Blockade took just about one full day progression before the test of Jaina hit the top two competitors for the last tier, Limit and Method again. The same general methods of gearing applied once again for this tier as no real changes were made lots of Azerite grinding, and lots of insane strategies. Jaina walled guilds for a considerably longer amount of time, and ended up being one of the hardest bosses Blizzard has ever made. Jaina went through a number of hotfixes as she was being progressed. For Myth of Difficulty, on February 2nd, 2019, Jaina was allowed to cast while moving for easier positioning rates. The scaling of the Eye Shard debuff was correctly adjusted, causing a buff in her kit, and a final bug fix that caused players to unintentionally gain additional stacks of chilling touch. Both guilds discovered that the troll racial De Voodoo Shuffle work to the JD encounter. Basically, Jaina's entire fight dealt with a really heavy slowing crowd control that stacked up to 20 times. And with a 20% reduction in duration from the racial, they could actually let the mechanic fall off and basically negate the mechanic after transition. Once this little trick was discovered by Method and Limit, they began to reach 10% pulls on the boss. This was such a significant reduction to a mechanic that everyone except for their paladins and demon hunters made the swap to troll. Jaina's Tide Elemental ad had an ability called Splitting Frost, which basically lets it split into smaller versions of itself upon death. To work around this, Method would literally just ignore the ad and send all of their cooldowns into Jaina to get as much damage as possible in before lethal. On February 4th, Blizzard allowed the ad to cast its Water Bolt Volley at 100 energy rather than when a kick was missed, making this strategy much riskier. Blizzard would then hotfix it again to remove this change, as it was an unintended addition that made the fight too hard. Since it was a bug that existed for nearly a full week, Blizzard thought it best if they just kept it as it was so players would not have to adjust their strategy so dramatically. Limit had stated that it was clear that the phase through the encounter was changed multiple times by Blizzard, forcing them to flip-flop around new strategies they didn't once have to because they originally planned their cooldowns around not dying to the phase through mechanics. Jaina went through a whole plethora of hotfixes during her run, and with the sleep schedules of Limit being from NA and Method from EU, many began to question the fairness of the changes as one guild would get less time to adapt, while the other had much more time. Really, there's nothing Blizzard can do about this, and it's just how the game will continue to function. As they are an NA-based company, but their timings for nerfs on bosses has unintentionally favored Method in the long run as well. With this in mind, the NA servers would reset and allow Limit to reclear the raid for additional gear, but this proved futile, sadly as Method managed to down Jaina in a nail-biter attempt with 446 wipes after 7 days, securing yet another EU win. Even after the race and the Hall of Fame close, Jaina was nerfed hard for any remaining cutting-edge guilds to bring her down. Instead of the 2 minute long cast of Howling Winds she begins at the start of the phase, it's now 10 minutes. This change alone would create a strategy similar to the race the world first where you ignore all the mechanics and just straight slam the boss for as much damage as possible. 
This can be achieved by just not interrupting her cast once you find her and brute forcing through it as fast as you can before being overwhelmed. This was utilized later in the expansion when Blizzard added a skip that brought you straight to Jaina to farm her mount, the Glacial Tide Storm. Even pug groups could get together, move as a unit, and burn the boss down with excessive damage and healing. Additionally, players trapped in the ice block when trying to find Jane in the Storm of Ice would now have 25% less health to break them free, and she will always teleport to a predictable location, allowing a very predetermined method to bring her down when on farm. With Battle for Dazar Lore's race concluded, Blizzard opted to ease the content drought between raid tiers with another mini raid to give players something to do in the meantime. It was only a two boss raid and was tuned around the idea that players attempting it on even the hardest difficulty would already be geared to the teeth, so they could dial it up to 11. Funny enough, the item level of Crucible Storms itself wasn't actually that great. Even the equip effects granted by certain pieces of loot from the instance weren't that sought after, as it was very minimal damage or healing increases to most classes. Before Crucible went live, many guilds viewed it as a low-key kind of raid that not a lot of many people took seriously. But a race of world first was sure to happen regardless. Limit was included in this more casual approach for the raid, placing 25th in the world for the kill in the final boss rather than their usual second place. So, when it came to raiding Crucible, everyone quickly realized how actually insane these bosses were. The race to kill just two bosses ended up being a complete nine days, longer than the battle for Dazara Lore, a nine boss instance. With the Unot encounter, players would receive three special relics that helped them complete the encounter. The Trident of Deep Ocean for tanks to place a shield that reduces damage for the people, the Void Stone for healers to make the boss adds and players immune, and Tempest Caller for DPS to kill off ads. What made this fight so hard for even the best players was the mechanic Unstable Resonance. This mechanic marks a chunk of the raid and forces players to run to someone of the same mark to remove it. If you run into someone of the opposite mark, you would most certainly one-shot everyone around you, resulted in a wipe. Before, the Resonance debuff used to just instantly kill you if you ran into the incorrect mark, meaning you had to be spread for your raid almost at all times to avoid getting the debuff and killing someone the moment it did. On April 26, 2019, Unstable Residence was made to have a short delay before Retrograde's explosion, allowing for more ample stacking of the raid for Healing Cleave. Blizzard would then implement more changes to allow players to easily find their partners for this mechanic on April 29, 2019, with less Oblivion tier casts, less frequent incomings of the Eye of Nazoth, and an increase of the debuff duration from 12 to 15 seconds. When it came to the Eyes of Nazoth, it would send large beams across the arena that must be dodged very carefully. Very commonly, this would be cast at the same time as Unstable Resonance, so not only do you need to avoid the beams, you have to be very careful about who is around you to not one-shot them. You could see in many guide videos that guilds would stack as many warlocks as possible to just use their demonic circle teleport ability to completely skip the mechanic. After this, guilds were finally able to start reaching phase 3 of the encounter and refining their methods to kill the old god minion. Because all of the hardest mechanics occurred in the phase 1 of the fight, many of the wipes that were counted were in the first few minutes of the encounter, as almost no one could progress beyond it. Oblivion Tear was a simple swirly effect players must dodge to avoid the damage it causes and from healing the boss, but on top of all the other mentioned mechanics and the fact the arena is steadily getting smaller as time progresses, you can see why even the best players can have issues. With all these really early wipes in Phase 1, it artificially inflated the numbers and drove it to the highest wipe count in recorded history for World First. Having those three extra seconds to get to your target greatly improved the original rush needed to reach your target, and players could be much safer now. Even if three seconds doesn't sound like much, it was a complete game changer. Once skills would reach the further phases, they would be presented with the Insatiable Torment cast. This cast would make the target immune to outside healing unless they stood on top of other players and siphoned their health further out. During this time, Warlocks were insanely good at keeping themselves alive with Drain Life and Soul Leech, so many players chose to bring as many Warlocks as they could just to outheal the ability on their own without needing to hurt their raid. They also brought a ton of elemental shamans simply because the fight was a gruesome damage check and melee in this encounter would be limited to literally just the tanks, as trying to do damage as melee on Mythic was borderline impossible. The only other melee often seen in the DPS role was just Demon Hunters for their Chaos Brand debuff, which gives everyone in the raid 5% more magic damage. Because of the previously mentioned low-key approach many guilds had for this raid, they went in severely underprepared. Method had planned for only a few days of raiding and were not counting on the events that transpired, forcing a day where the GM was not actually present for a day of raiding, costing them a large portion of their lead. And also like mentioned before, Limit got 25th in the world, and it was the EU Guild pieces that managed to bring down this beam of the boss and an insane 731 pools after 9 whole days of raiding, thus dethroning Method's years-long streaks of wins. 
Even now, in Dragonflight, this boss still can hold a raid back if they aren't completely maxed out. Since this raid, Blizzard has never done a mini-style type of raid again, even at the behest of players asking for something like this to fill the void of content gaps. Although it's pretty easy to understand why if they would potentially fumble the 2D like Unot again. Just two months after the Crucible of Storms fiasco, Blizzard would release their next raid, Eternal Palace. This tier came with brand new changes to how player power worked in the form of Azerite Essences. Essentially, your artifact necklace would now be further enhanced with higher levels, unlocking systems where you may place new abilities into the necklace to become stronger. During Eternal Palace's run, you could have one major essence that would very often give you a brand new button to press, which would increase your throughput dramatically, and two minor essence slots that gave your character passive buffs. There would be a certain amount of powers for every roll, and then tank, healer, and DPS specific essences. You could obtain these power-ups through basically any means of content, varying from open world, PvP, Mythic Plus, and raiding. Each form of content varying the essence you are currently working towards. On top of this, the essences had rank systems, rank 1 being the weakest version and rank 3 being the strongest. There was a rank 4 version, but it was purely cosmetic and was awarded to players for completing the most challenging content, like killing Mythic Ajara. This system completely changed the class balance, and shifted the Race to World First Guild's method of gearing, going for the absolute best essence for each class on top of the best gear and Azerite traits. Once the race began, a reasonable amount of time was spent progressing each boss, about 1-2 to two days for each outside of the first two. Similar to the battle for Dazara lore, however, Queen Ajara would progress for 8 whole days before her first kill. Furthermore, Ajara was hit with hotfixes after hotfixes in order to tune her properly for the first kill, the same way Jaina was, but basically doubled. Trinket composition was another anomaly of this race. It can be seen in many of the Queen Ajara mythic kills during current that a large majority of the raid was using the Ajara's font of power and the custom Megagon pocket size computation device trinkets. Basically, the font of power could be cast, and the longer you cast it, the longer you got a large stat stick buff for your character. It was an insanely good trinket during this time, and it was hard to find anyone not using the trinket. When it came to the computation device, players could socket custom punch cards into the sockets of the trinkets and create their own trinket with the punch cards available to them. This allowed players of really any skill and class to create a trinket that perfectly suited them. There was also a strange controversy in terms of gear when it came to the newly acclaimed Benthic gear, which dropped from basically anything in the open world of Nashitar. This gear could be upgraded relatively high in terms of item level with another open world of 10 currency, and they had unique equip effects that benefited you whenever you were in the world of Nashitar or in the raid, the Eternal Palace. A good example of this was the Zangir Scale Guard Great Belts, which simply made you do 2% more damage to aberrations in the Eternal Palace. Or Gozo and Zakul, the second to last boss, were considered aberrations end game. So, having this belt was a complete must for these encounters because you just did more damage at the cost of nothing. It's really never been reiterated upon again because open world gear becoming a large stable endgame rating was not something Blizzard intended, and something like Benthic gear that gives you a bonus in raids for wearing it has never really returned. The raid was also the first time Limit had begun streaming their progression to the world alongside Method. So everyone can now watch the pulls in real time and see how close both would to get it. During the progression of Ajar, Method's beginning would be pretty unstable. The main gimmick of the fight, Ancient Wards, is if you let their energy reach zero, your group would wipe. During the encounter, players must keep the wards empowered by standing on them. Standing on them will reduce the character's maximum HP, and before certain nerfs hit the boss, it required you to get 7 stacks, significantly cutting your health pull down. It basically would always one-shot the raid with outside mechanics for this effort, and there was no real workaround until the nerf. With the nerf in place, Method could now attempt only 5 stacks of the debuff, and made great progress alongside Limit. On July 26, 2019, the time for Phase 3 to end was increased to 3 minutes from 2 minutes, and the overzealous Hulk ad would have its health reduce. There was also a chunk of bug fixes that improved the fight's quality of life, such as the Titan console's extra action button not appearing in the final phase in all difficulties. Additionally, any remaining ads in Phase 3 took 3 minutes instead of 2 to go berserk, giving the raiders a larger time frame to bring them down. Interestingly, Method elected to heal the fight with only 2 healers and an off healer, with a balanced druid using Restoration Affinity for certain intervals of extra healing. This was a very risky gamble, as normally in the mythic setting you're required to have 4 healers, so dropping not just 1, but 2 for more damage means you have to play even more perfectly than normal. It's not like the end boss of mythic raids to be over or under 2 when players first get to it, as it's really hard to test the skill range of everyone involved at the very highest level of the game. 
so Ajara getting multiple nerves through her AD progression makes a ton of sense. But she definitely was one of the most nerfed end bosses to exist. Once again, however, Method would rein in another victory just 8 hours before a limit would kill Ajara. With 12 days spent in the Eternal Palace and 359 wipes on Ajara for Method, and 527 for a limit. Even after the kill, more nerfs would hit Ajara for the remaining guilds on October 19th, 2019. Generally, the fight's adds had a 10% HP nerf, and the wards of power would gain additional 5 points upon empowering them. Most of the Ajara nerfs are focused on ward soaking. The DPS check is only slightly nerfed in Phase 3, which is the most difficult phase of the fight. You'll still need to learn how to deal with the ward soaks, but the fight feels a lot more forgiving now. It's much more difficult to pressure Surge in Phase 3, even without ward soaks, and you'll have more health to handle the mechanics, so you'll be able to make a little bit more mistakes. For BFA's final raid tier at Nihalatha, the game of Race to World First would change completely in terms of both gearing and raid lineups. When it came to gearing, all the previous methods continued to apply, but now there is an addition of another minor Azerite essence slot in the new Corruption system. In place of Warforging, a system that would just randomly proc your gear to be a higher item level was Corruptions. Corruptions would be a ranked base RNG proc system on gear that enhances your player's power immensely. Basically, a piece of gear could drop, and it had a chance to proc a random corruption effect. They have three ranks in total for most of them, and the higher ranks, the stronger it was, at the cost of having to avoid additional mechanics. It was a very risk-to-reward system, and you had to carefully balance your corruption sum in order to not just kill your character the moment you entered combat. These corruption powers were extremely overpowered, and like actually overpowered and not YouTuber clickbait fake overpowered and they had to go through many, many nerfs to bring them to a level that was playable. One of the more notable corruptions was Infinite Stars, which was a burst of damage that would ramp higher the longer you fought a boss, sometimes ending up as your third or first in damage and not your actual class's kit. Because of the RNG around getting the corruptions you wanted, getting the specific gear you wanted for your character was insanely hard, and many members of Method and Limit were lacking simply due to bad luck. On top of the gearing process, Blizzard would add a brand new Legendary Cloak quest line that was completely required to even attempt the Carapus and Nizoth and Nizoth himself. Without this cloak, you would be immediately mind controlled, so every player of the raid would need to perform the quest to obtain it. You could then upgrade the cloak through a system called Horrific Visions, a timer-based scenario that tests your skills in the corrupted reality of Azeroth. It made the world first players fight even harder for the best possible gear, as Legendary Cloak was absolutely the highest item level cloak they could want to wear at the time. Now, when it finally came to raiding in the raid itself, Limit had to come up with a strategy never before seen called the 21st Man. Every mythic raid is specifically tuned to have 20 players in it at a time, meaning their raid leader, Max, had to be in the runs with them. This 21st Man strategy involved Max sitting out from the raid and bringing in someone different while Max simply watched the raid and made callouts from an outside perspective to allow his raiders to have full focus and attention while performing their jobs to perfection. It proved to be an effective idea as Limit absolutely stomped this race, not allowing Method a single world first kill of any of the bosses, including Nizoth himself. It became such a stable for raiding that Method, soon to be Echo, adopted the strategy as well and Limit continues to use it to this day for their raids. In fact, the 21st Man has basically become a staple of World First Race going forward. With all this, the usual tuning that followed these types of raiders meant corruptions were being constantly tuned, and even withheld in order to not skew the race further. This is seen on February 6, 2020, as Blizzard realized how overpowered certain corruptions were and how the top guilds utilized them to an unintended effect. But Limit had reached a point so deep into the raid that nerfing it now would surely make the raid nearly impossible, or create another week of raiding entirely. Nizoth was also infamously buggy. Occasionally, Blizzard would add a mythic-only final phase to an encounter that is a complete secret, and they provide no information about it, meaning the raiders must learn on the spot how to adapt to the new mechanic. In order to start this phase, the boss would either be in its second phase for 2.5 minutes, or would it hit 25% health, confirmed by Ian Hizikosin himself on Twitter. Strangely, Limit noticed that the gateway which led to the secret phase could just be ignored and you could continue hitting the boss. They realized soon that doing so and getting the boss to 25% will trigger the event a second time, completely bugging the encounter. There was also a weird bug that even after doing the secret phase and getting the boss to 25% health, the gateway would respawn, but you would not have to complete it, confusing almost everyone involved. There was even a time Limit was getting a really solid pull in, and upon finishing the secret phase, the boss just automatically reset on them forcing a complete do-over of an already good attempt. Nizoth was another example of requiring what some players call the God Pool, where every mechanic that occurs happens in a perfect manner that's more so determined by RNG rather than a set timer. 
An example of this were the rotating beams of stupefying glare. These beams would either rotate left or right, and could be random in which way they moved. It could even be seen on the World First Kill Limit Achieved that while playing incredibly well, they had hoped and greatly relied on these beams to move in a direction that greatly favored them. It was a pretty long encounter too. Nearly 10 minutes from start to finish and both guilds had very close kill attempts lined up meaning that the nearly perfect pull for 10 minutes they had just needed to be completely redone. It was definitely a morale drainer, which certainly fits with the old god in question. After a long 10 days, thankfully shorter than the Eternal Palace, Nizoth was brought down by limit after 270 pulls, marking them as the first in a winners of the race to win world first in 8 years. It was a long trend of limits steadily creeping up to methods since Legion, and finally they'd risen above and claimed their very first world first end boss kill, with more to come in the future now that they had nailed themselves into history. With all this in mind, the Falling Raiders would see a nerf into Zoth in April 20th, 2020, to the amount of sanity drained through the Thought Harvester via the Harvest Thoughts, a prolific mechanic to ensure you do not get mind controlled. The damage of Evoke Anguish was lowered by 50%, and Nizoth's total health was lowered by 5%. Even with those changes, he was still a pretty long fight, and there were even guilds who were able to lust twice per fight if they'd elected to use it earlier on. And this completes our complete history for the Battle for Azeroth Radiant experience. It tells the story of Limit's true rise to World First Contenders, and no longer the Silver Medal, as Method gives them a run for their money each race. Alongside it all, we saw the final mini raid of WoW, and truly how difficult and determined players can be when they put their minds together and have a great time. BFA had some of the toughest bosses to date, and Blizzard has learned a lot since then. And just like Blizzard, so too have the players, crowning even more winners of future Mythic raid tiers. Lots of drama and gear and problems aside with BFA, was there anything you remember from raiding in BFA? Be sure to let us know down below your experiences and favorite memories.